Welcome to episode number 312 of Category 5 Technology TV. It's Tuesday, the 10th of September, 2013. Nice to see you. I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Erica Lalonde. And man, it has it been a while since I've been here. It's been a little while, eh? <laughs> yeah. But hey, coming up in the newsroom tonight, um, Twitter is being used by a special program to determine the general mood of the entire countries by simply following its citizens and spying on what they say. Mm. Yahoo is sick of the American government thwarting their desire to tell the public when U.S. national security agencies um, demand confidential user data, so they're taking it to court. Think you've got privacy with that fancy secure webcam you got? Well, think again. The FTC is cracking down on popular camera manufacturers whose video feeds can be viewed by anyone and anywhere. Yikes. And a man was able to rescue his six-year-old son after a thief drove off with his car containing both the boy and an iPhone. Stick around, those stories are coming up. Thanks, Erica. Uh, tonight, we were meant to talk about a new VMware partnership. It's all about the vCloud. You're going to want to uh, check that out. We are postponing that interview until uh, early October, so don't miss that. Uh, for tonight, we are going to, well, we've got a huge response based on last week's show about the MK602 from Rico Magic. We're going to be answering your questions with regards to that device. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. At EcoAlkalines, we believe you should be able to trust your batteries not just here, but here, here, and here. But with one exception, you should also be able to trust your batteries here. EcoAlkalines are the world's first and only certified carbon neutral battery manufactured to the highest standards of recycling and quality, without any trace amounts of harmful chemicals like mercury, lead, or cadmium. EcoAlkalines provide performance that rivals leading national alkaline battery brands at a comparable price. Find out more about the EcoAlkalines difference. EcoAlkalines.com this is Category 5 Technology TV. So good to have you here uh, with us this week. Nice to see you, Erica. Yes, it's good to see it's you, too. It's been a while. How's school been? Now, you finished school. This was the story. She finished school and then started it back up again. Yeah. So as a glutton for punishment, how's it been? Um, Good. I yeah. had a month off, which a was month? nice. Well, that's not so bad. Most okay. university students get four months off. I had a month, but that's mm -hmm. okay. You're working I hard, then. all the extra learning. All that, oh, good. you know, summers, everyone's partying. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> oh. Speaking of partying. <laughs> I'm now 19. <laughs> I don't know how she made that connection. I was going to say, I really like clowns. <laughs> well, 19. Well, hey, congratulations on that front. <laughs> yeah. Stay safe. I'm, I have been. It's been really great, yeah. honestly. It's, it's nice. If We're people, in Canada, by the way. Yeah, folks. in Canada, 19 is the legal drinking age. 18, <laughs> you can go to Montreal and Quebec. <laughs> Neat. Yeah. <laughs> Look forward to your 19th birthday then. <laughs> well, it, it was good. and no, Nothing against Quebec and Montreal. We yeah, love you. you know, love you. you're 18. They, they give you a year start. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Okay, hey, check out our mobile website, m.cat5.tv. All you have to do is scan that code or visit that website with your mobile device. You'll be able to watch live. You'll be able to tune in to the audio of the broadcast and uh, and actually watch past episodes right there at m.cat5.tv as well. Speaking of kind of being able to get around, uh, I want to take a look at our map. Sorry, you were uh, just about to say something and I interrupted, but look at this. <laughs> I think this is so cool, folks. This is where you guys and gals are watching from tonight. Wow. And a lot of these places, you know, I don't even I necessarily recognize. I saw Luxembourg. There's Moscow. Wow. And surrounding cities and, and uh, Washington, D.C. Washington. Yeah. New York. New York. So thank you to everyone who's watching uh, from all around the world tonight and throughout the week on demand as well. Category5.tv, it's always uh, just wonderful to have you here. 
Uh, please pop us an email live at category5.tv if you'd like to say hi. And if you'd like to see where everybody's watching from, go to map.cat5.tv. And Category 5 is a member of the Tech Podcast. If it's tech, it's here. And is the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. All right. Well, we've got your viewer questions in tonight, um, and we are definitely going to tackle those. Um, I've got a lot that you know I want to I want to look at tonight. Before we get into the show, I just want to let you know if you don't know it already, a, a, this is for you Star Trek fans out there, all you Trekkies and Trekkers. There is a new pilot going forth using Indiegogo to fund the project. And what's so exciting about this is that it has a lot of people that we actually know and love. Tim Russ, for example, is the director of the pilot. So Tim Russ, of course, being uh, Tuvok from Star Trek Voyager. Uh, we've got people like the, the actor who played Harry Kim and, and all that. Go to cat5.tv slash Star Trek. That's going to take you to the Indiegogo uh, profile for this. And the reason that I want to direct you to this, notice that there are only three days left to oh, this. No. And you see that there is just a wealth of information about this upcoming series. There's Tim Russ, uh, Garrett Wang, uh, who played uh, Harry Kim, Robert Picardo, who played the doctor, uh, the holographic doctor. He's playing Dr. Zimmerman. Uh, and a bunch of other familiar faces. Uh, Richard Hurd, who played uh, Tom Paris's dad. He's playing uh, Admiral Paris again. And so it's, it's legit. Like, this is the real thing when it comes to, you know, we all dream of a new Star Trek series. And so what they're actually doing is they're, they're doing a pilot. They're going to pitch it to the studio, and they're going to hope for the best. So this is your chance to help fund that. Uh, they're going to be going forward anyway because they met their minimum goal. But as they raise more and more funds, they're going to be throwing things out like uh, being able to do better makeup, being able to do better sets, being able to do more with what money they've been able to raise. So, And you know you can donate to that, and you'll be able to pick up a free copy in HD of the video once it's out. So, it's awesome. Yeah, cat5.tv slash Star Trek for that. Welcome to our registered viewers. I don't know if you want to tackle the list of uh, people who are joining us uh, who are new on our website this week, category5.tv. Uh, we got Root Lennox. I like that hey, yeah. name. Uh, Carl WC. Uh, Gary85739. Hello. We got the big one. We got Droid1, Mike69DE, and Pear.Tree. Pear.Tree. <laughs> nice to have you all joining us. If you'd like to become a registered viewer on our website, category5.tv is the place to go. You can register right there. Uh, thank you uh, also to our viewers who have sent in donations this week. You know that we got hit by lightning here at the studio last Monday. Uh, just, just. I mean, it was over the tree line, but it, it was, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was obvious that we got hit, and it fried a uh, couple of UPSs and uh, our cable modem. Cable modem was a rental, so they replaced it, no problem. Uh, the UPSs we had to re uh, replace with ones that we had in stock, but we had to put new batteries in it. So we've done that uh, all in all after tax, and everything came to 155 bucks. so that was awesome. And I appreciate your support in uh, being able to do that. And now we're raising funds. As you know, we're back to raising funds for the new garage studio. Uh, really exciting things on the horizon, such as chroma key, which is green screening, uh, so that nice. you'll be able to uh, see us in new environments. And you know, even though we have a small space to work with, we'll have uh, a virtual environment that we can interact with. So we're very, very excited about what's to come. And your donations are largely what's helping us to be able to do that. You can go to cat5.tv C um, to support us in that. And also, um, if you'd like to have me sign into your computer with TeamViewer, uh, I can actually remote into your computer tonight if you like. And TeamViewer allows us to take control and actually help you with some of the issues that you may be experiencing with your Linux or Windows computer. So if that's you, uh, all you have to do is uh, private message me in the chat room. It's Category 5 on Freenode. Or feel free to also send in your questions by telephone. It's 2545 cat 5 tv you can give us a quick call so we were looking at this really cool device from rico magic the mk602 last week and this device um, is a full 1080p video 
um, kind of converter for your dumb TV, as I would call it, and it turns <laughs> it smart. into it turns it into a smart TV. So. Not only that, but it's also got a built-in webcam for Skype video conferencing, so you can actually chat with people uh, live through the internet through Skype video, and it's got all those kinds of things. We looked at that last week. If you're interested in that, episode number 311 is the episode to check out, but our response to that device and the review of that device has been uh, just astronomical this Mm -hmm. week. We've got so many emails, so many comments, and uh, we really appreciate you interacting with us. And the questions, you know, just keep flowing. And I'm here to answer your questions. And I thought it'd be very appropriate to do it, you know, the following week so that, uh, you know, those questions can be answered. So first and foremost, the the device costs about $95, regular price. Uh, You can get it online. Sometimes you can find it cheaper. um, But that's uh, the base price is about 95 bucks. Very inexpensive. Mm-hmm. It does not come with a controller. I, I'm not necessarily reading all of your questions, but I'm going to answer as many of the questions as I can. It doesn't include a controller. However, it works with your Wii remote. Um, you can actually use a Wii remote in order to control it. But if you don't have a Wii, uh, you can also use just a plug-in mouse and keyboard. You can use a wireless mouse and keyboard is kind of ideal. You can purchase something like the device which I showed you last week, which is the, uh, this is the MK7022, I believe. Yes, MK7022 from Rico Magic, which is the full universal remote with the QWERTY keyboard on the back. And it's an air mouse. It's got a Skype speaker and microphone so that when you're sitting on the couch, you can just chat like this and see them up on the screen. This is the ideal controller from Rico Magic, the MK7022. Uh, but that one, you know, it costs, I think it's around $80 or so. It's not, uh, you know, again, not a hugely expensive thing, considering it's Bluetooth and it'll work with any device. This will even work with your computer if you wanted to use it to control a computer. So it's pretty awesome. But you don't have to go that route. Just a simple mouse, keyboard will get you there, uh, and the Wiimote. So, um, next questions. Okay, it's dual core. We tried to establish that last mm-hmm. week. Uh, dual core processor with eight gigabytes of RAM uh, or flash included. It's uh, Android 4.1. It has Bluetooth. It has Wi-Fi. Uh, it has Ethernet. It has HDMI output as well as audio video output, so that you can plug it into an old TV and make your old. Um, CRT TV, uh, a smart TV, which is astounding. Um, And it does have full 1080p output. That's what they claim. But that brings us to our first question. I don't know if you'd like to read this, Erica, but Pear Tree writes us. Yeah, I was just looking at this. Um, We just watched your review on the new MK602 device. And to be honest, I don't know much about uh, that one. However, showing mode lines doesn't prove anything. Have you actually tried switching to 1920 uh, at uh, 1080? Did it work? So, well, <laughs> let's... Here's the... I, I, sense, I sense a challenge. I love the tone <laughs> of your, your message there. <laughs> it's a challenge. Yes. Showing mode lines doesn't prove anything. And you're right. I mean, when I was doing the demonstration last week, I just kind of brought up, you know, yeah, you see that it can do 1920 by 1080. So I said, okay, well, I'll plug it back in. Everything's still hooked up. So here we go. We're going to fire this thing up. And uh, we'll actually take a look at this uh, tonight for you. And we're going to switch the resolution. Now, when you plug in a device like this to your TV, typically, what do you see? You see a little uh, a little box up in the top left-hand side, or whatever this says. You know, 1280 by 720, progressive scan. You might say 12... You know, 1920 by 1080, and that's how you can tell. You know, that's a real easy way. Now, we don't have a TV that I can plug it into and show you that will do that. What we do have is Wirecast, Telestream Wirecast, and an Avermedia uh, capture card. We we've got HDMI output going directly into that Rico Magic uh, MK602 into the Avermedia capture card, so we can still emulate that exact effect by changing the resolution. So. Uh, as that boots up, <coughs> uh, here we go. Okay, so all that I need to do, I'm going to demonstrate this for you. We're going to go up into the applications here, uh, go into settings, and we want to change the screen resolution. So, not under display, it's under screen. And you'll see the HDMI mode. So what I'm going to show you here, we're actually capturing this to Telestream Wirecast at 1280 by 720. That's what we're broadcasting in right now. 
Uh, so what we want to do is we want to bump that up to 1920 by 1080. So we're going to go HDMI mode and let's try uh, at 50. And you'll see that I'm now I've lost the screen because I'm capturing at 12, 1280 by 720. So if I increase that now to the full resolution that I that it's supposedly giving me, 1920 by 1080, you see the captures back and it's working perfectly at that resolution. So we're actually getting true 1080p. We'll go up to 60. And there we go. Still have control. Everything's working great. And that's at full 1920 by 1080. That's not squished or anything. So if I change the resolution to a resolution other than 1080p, you'll see that it doesn't bring in the input at all. There's 1280 by 720, which I was originally using, and it worked. And there, as you see, um, it's required that uh, it actually works. So 1080p is for real. Because the impression that I got uh, from your email was that uh, we were actually, um, that you suspected that it wasn't true. Well, well it is. And I hope that we've proved that for you tonight. So, Okay, next question that we received uh, about that, and I hope that with the mic difficulties there that you were able to make out what I said, but I hope that the demonstration, and so there, there's my distraction there. Um, <laughs> our next uh, message comes from at Melendis. And they say, Robbie Ferguson just watched episode number 311. Question, does the MK602 support playback of H.264 encoded MP4s using, uh, oh, I'm he's basically saying I'm using Rasp BMC for it right now. So uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate that. First, we're just going to uh, nip these uh, mic issues in the bud. Can I just get access to your mic here? Thank you. There we go. And just make sure that's there. Okay, hopefully... You let us know, chat room, okay, if, uh, <laughs> if we have any more issues. Okay, so the question, does it support H.264 MP4s? Best way probably for me to, to determine that is to use one of our uh, MP4 files. So I'm going to bring up our website, category5.tv, and we'll go to the show, RSS feeds and subscriptions, and we'll just grab, uh, there's our H.264 feed click on that and let's save last week's episode which is a I know it's an h.264 file so I'll throw that onto my desktop and that's gonna take about one minute to download so talk amongst yourselves one full minute of uh, needing to figure out while we download 13 seconds it jumped look at that skyrocketed no word of a lie Nine seconds. How did that happen? Very accurate um, as far as its assumptions as to how long it's going to take. Two, one, done. Okay, so now I've got a copy of that file on my desktop. There it is. Okay, so best thing for us to do is go into terminal. And we're going to go into my desktop. And I'm going to go media info and that file. Media Info is a great tool for Linux that tells us all about the codecs and everything about that file, just so that we can see that this is indeed what we're looking for. It is a YUVH.264 file with AAC audio. Everything looks good. MPEG-4, and I actually encoded that with, I think, now that says AVC. I hope that this is the right format. I think it is. But let's just uh, let's just determine it by uh, I'm going to transfer it over onto my SD card here and plug that in. And this is really really easy. Uh, I mean the SD card adapter, uh, or the SD port in the back here. Just plug that right into there, and it's going to detect that no problem. Still having issues, or are we good? No, we're all, all right. good to awesome. go. Okay. They're so with that in, sounds crystal clear. Perfect. You can see my card has been detected. And I'm just going to go into the video player, and we'll see that that, there you go, that file is right there. So click on it. Welcome to episode number three of Category loud. 5 Technology TV. It's Tuesday, the 3rd of September, 20. Right. So the, there we go. I mean, that's, that's that file from our H.264 feed. Uh, no issues there coming off of an SD card. We can access it through the file browser, too, on your network if you have a central storage uh, mechanism like a NAS unit or something. Um, you can use that to actually store your videos. 
uh, download your RSS feeds to that, like a Category 5 and any other podcast, podcast that you watch, and you'll be able to stream them directly to the device through Wi-Fi, through Ethernet. Works pretty good. So, and I'll keep testing, and you know, if you send in your questions, I'll keep testing and playing around. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure that that file format is what you're looking for. But if you have a specific file that you want me to test with, hey, send it over. I'll do a media info on it, um, and we can we can test it on the Rico Magic device for you and tell you what what we find. It's as easy as that. Cool. All right. Well, hey, if you've got questions for us, uh, join us in the chat room. Um, you're. Uh, Erica is watching the chat room and we're good to go. What's up? Thanks, Heather. Thank Heather, we appreciate you very, very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So get your questions into the chat room, category five on Freenode. And uh, we've got some questions that have come in. So I'd like to maybe hit a couple of those before we, uh, before we move along. Here okay. Go. All right. Good, good, um, good. We got, so we got one. Um, from Roy, uh, Roy W. Nash. Hey, Roy. So, for those with older machines that may have problems with Flash video and they don't want to fall back to an, an older version of Flash, then try this plugin for Firefox. It oh. converts Flash video to HTML5 on the fly without any noticeable lag any flash plugins must be disabled first for the replacement plugin to work. That's interesting. Okay, I'm clicking the link here from your email, Roy. Mm -hmm. YouTube flash to HTML5. Okay, so it's YouTube. So to be clear, it's not converting. Now they've said it converts YouTube flash videos to HTML5. I doubt it converts. What, what happens though is that when I upload a video to YouTube, they automatically transcode everything. So there are HTML5 or MP4 files available now based on the transcoding process. So maybe what they're doing is they're replacing the Flash player with an HTML5 player, which if you use a browser that supports HTML5, that's going to be the default anyways because that's what, uh, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's going to push toward WebM. That's what Google wants you to use. Uh, but that's kind of cool. So if you're using Firefox, an older version that doesn't support uh, HTML5, uh, out of the box on YouTube, then maybe that will just, I would think it would strip the code and change it to a, an HTML5 thing. So anyways, there you go. Addons.mozilla.org. Search for YouTube Flash to HTML5, and we'll post a link in the show notes for episode number uh, 312. And this is Category 5 Technology TV. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Uh, questions, uh, feel free to pick up the phone, 2545-CAT5-TV, or pop us a line in the chat room. It's Category 5 on Freenode or just through our website. So. Well, we've got some, I think, some interesting news stories that we yes. could... Uh, a lot on privacy as well. I think uh, that's kind of the theme. The theme, internet is kind of going that way. I mean, if it's not about what's going on in Syria, it's going to be about the privacy <laughs> issues and the fact that the government in the U.S. has basically found ways around the encryption on your cell phones. And so now everybody's talking about the fact that, oh, the NSA is listening to your phone calls. It's all about security and national security and personal security. And now... And now, we present you with the, the news. top stories from the Category 5 newsroom. So, British scientists have developed a computer program they say can map the mood of the nation using Twitter. Hmm. Named Emotive, it works by accessing the emotional content of postings on the social networking site. The team responsible for developing says it can scan up to 2,000 tweets a second and rate them for expressions of one of eight human emotions. They claim a motive could help calm civil un unrest and identify early threats to public safety. Hmm. I wonder how accurate that could possibly be because you think, uh, like, as you're yeah. telling the story, I'm thinking about... You know, sports games. Okay, so it's using Twitter to determine the mood of the nation, you know, and so they're watching for civil unrest, and all of a sudden there's this flood of, this sucks, you made a bad call, you're such an idiot, and this is going on all of a sudden, and thousands and thousands of people are tweeting, you know, after the football game. Or maybe after the referees, what's Twitter going to do? Exactly. Contact the referees. Uh, a million people are mad at you right now. 
Well, they'll just be the the computer program might think that they're they're about to erupt into civil unrest. Well, they're gonna riot, you know, some way or another. Let them do it on the internet. Yeah, <laughs> and and then you gotta admit that there are some that just tweet nothing but nonsense. Yeah, and like, so how like do what they... about those people who complain about their life every day? Oh yes, <laughs> what about you? No, you're not. You're you don't do that. Of course you don't. Oh, life's good. Yeah. Well, hey, that's it. Kind of. It kind of. It's like a whole different spin on the Big Brotherish thing. And and the Onion actually recently touched on this. I don't know if you watched the Onion, but I recommend that you check some of their stuff out. Some of it's not uh, G-rated by any stretch, but um, they recently touched on you know the 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 NSA and the mm-hmm. this you know CIA and FBI all actually own um, Facebook and Twitter. After years of secretly monitoring the public, we were astounded so many people would willingly publicize where they live, their religious and political views, an alphabetized list of all their friends, personal email addresses, phone numbers, hundreds of photos of themselves, uh, and even status updates about what they were doing moment to moment. It is truly a dream come true for the CIA. Much of the credit belongs to CIA agent Mark Zuckerberg, who runs the day-to-day Facebook operation for the agency. And so it was this whole spoof on how um, those are actually monitoring services. And so it's <laughs> funny that in the news then all of a sudden, yeah, it's, they're actually able to take all that information, conglomerate it together, and generate some kind of information about the nation itself. It's kind of interesting. It, well, to me, what's interesting about this as well is that uh, you know, some kind of computer programming de- te- uh, detecting human emotions. Yeah, in our, in and what could writing. those eight emotions be? Yeah, like I'm okay, wondering. happiness, Happy, anger, anger, fear. Fear. That's three. Craziness. Is that an emotion? Crazy. It's an emotion. It's for an Erica. emotion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling craziness. Or, or my rage. I feel rage. rage. That kind of goes under a- anger. <laughs> I don't or know what else could there be. S- sad. Did we get sad? Yes. Um, how could there be anxiousness? So the computer knows of more emotions than we do. I mean, we've actually started making up emotions. So, hey, that's, that's kind of crazy. Okay, moving along, looking at Yahoo, they are demanding reprimands. No, they are actually taking uh, the U.S. National Security Agency to the courts. They are requesting uh, that they actually be allowed to disclose when the U.S. government requests personal user information and what it's all about. The move comes a few days after Yahoo published its first transparency report detailing the overall number of global government requests for data. U.S. laws, get this, they actually prohibit organizations from providing a breakdown of these figures. Uh, Yahoo said withholding such information from the public breeds mistrust and suspicion about the U.S. government. It's not all about Google. I mean, we hear all the time about how, you know, people are outraged that Google picked up some information while it was driving by your house with the Street View car. And now we're learning all these things and not to get into conspiracy theories whatsoever, but that they're actually silencing Yahoo and Yahoo wants to say, here's what the government has requested and here's why. And uh, as a matter of being transparent to their users. So it's going on where, you know, the government is requesting this information, private information about users of services like Yahoo, and they're not allowed to disclose it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. We'll see what happens there because they are actually putting their foot down and saying something has to change. Well, that's good because Facebook did nothing. Well, Facebook is owned by the FBI, aren't they? Yeah, and it's like they did nothing. (laughs) It's like... You know, like I, it's like, oh, so this person's doing all of this, but I like to get into their private messages at the same time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There was They're another not really private. There, there, there was an interesting video uh, that was going around and and became viral there for a little while, uh, where they had kind of staged uh, a tent to look like uh, a medium, so like a fortune teller kind of person, and so they brought people in and they and the person would sit down and this. Mm-hmm fortune teller would tell all about their personal life and the people were freaked out and they're like how do you know this and it's like all of this very personal stuff like i mean very personal is being disclosed by this fortune teller and so then as the curtain is drawn back they actually draw back a curtain 
they you see that there's a group of kind of hacker people that are actually using social media, Facebook, Twitter, and all of these kind of profile connections and hacking through accounts in order to get information that that person had posted online that they thought was private. But meanwhile, it's absolutely wide open if you know how to get access to it. So mm -hmm. a bit of an eye-opener when you think about all the private information that you're posting on Facebook. And I, I see some people put addresses on there. That's scary. Like home I phone numbers home or phone even num pictures from your cell phone. I mean, come on. Your cell phone has geolocation. So if you take a picture of your kid in the park across the street and you post it on Facebook, all of a sudden people who know how get the address of that park. That's scary stuff. Yeah. And it's real. That's legit stuff. I mean, enough <laughs> scary stuff. Do you have any good news? Um, <laughs> no, no. It's more scary <laughs> stuff. What is going on tonight? <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> well, a company whose home cameras were hacked, causing privacy... Uh, in, um, privacy complications for hundreds of people have been uh, abom abominished by the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. The FTC uh, scolded manufacturer uh, TrendNet for the weakness that meant supposedly private video feeds were in fact viewable uh, by anyone online. The company is now barred from referring uh, to their cameras as a secure in marketing material. The move is the first such crackdown by the FTC on connected home devices. Trendnet uh, issued a software patch to uh, combat the problem, but it was not um, an automatic upgrade. The FTC said the company must now make more effort to contract existing customers um, in instances when the crucial update has been released. That's kind of scary. I think about all those secure devices from t TrendNet that are marketed as like baby monitors and things. So you've got a video baby monitor. Well, then all of a sudden hackers came out and said, oh yeah, you can access the feed from that. And they started distributing these feeds and it's like, that's scary stuff. So, hard wire is the way to go. I guess that's the uh, the moral of the story mm -hmm. for tonight. And in a in a story that is also kind of a little bit sad in a way, more like because you just want to smack this guy a little bit, but with a happy ending. Glad to hear the kid is okay. A father whose SUV was stolen with his five-year-old son inside uh, used the Find My iPhone feature to help police locate the stolen vehicle and rescue the boy. The incident occurred in Houston, Texas, where the father left his son in the car while running into the store. Uh, someone took off with the vehicle. They probably didn't know that the kid was in the back. Uh, and after the father discovered that the car and his son was missing, um, he actually tapped into the Find My iPhone app because his iPhone was left in the vehicle. Fortunately, he actually had his iPad on him, and so he was able to do it fairly quickly and, and uh, was able to do that. Police then relied on the information to track the SUV and uh, arrested the carjacker and recovered the boy without any kind of incidents. Uh, the father was definitely thinking on his feet, I think, to tap into that technology, but I think also you just want to smack him and say, what are you thinking? Don't leave your kid in the car. But cool that technology has been able to do something that yeah, is... Yeah, like something yeah, that's very cool. quick like that. Find My Car app. Find My Car app. Good idea. You just need a GPS in your car. Yeah. Like OnStar. OnStar, where's my car? <laughs> my boy's in it. We could uh, do another movie of Dude, Where's My Car? <laughs> <laughs> but smart of the guy to think, <laughs> Dude, you know, in, in that car? moment where I would be freaking <laughs> out. I mean, if that was me, I'd be... I, I don't know how I'd react. I mean, you'd be just absolutely <laughs> frightened for your son, but, you know, forget about the car. But yeah. then to realize that, well, oh, I've got my phone in the car. Here's an idea. I'm going to pull out my iPad. Why? Maybe it was an iPad mini. I can't imagine that the guy left his iPhone sitting on the passenger seat, but then took his iPad into the store. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. But hey, that's good. Hey, check out the full stories on our website, newsroom.category5.tv. And when you're there, uh, you'll get you'll have the links to the full stories, videos, and everything that is there. Thanks to Roy W. Nash for submitting some stories this week. And uh, 
And that's if you have a news story that you think is worthy of an on-air mention, email newsroom at category5.tv. And for the Category 5 Newsroom, I'm Erica Lalonde. And I'm Robbie. <laughs> and also, uh, on that last story, Jot saying that um, in Europe, there are plans to put a GPS uh, GSM in every car so the right. car can dial in case of accidents, but this allows everybody to track a car as well. Yeah, I guess so. Eh? Well, that's mm-hmm. uh, that's kind of cool. Call I guess car. but uh, cars are becoming more and more computers anyways, right. right? So it makes sense that they would have GPSs built in, like GPS chips, because hopefully they're going to become driverless. Right? Right? <laughs> So you need to have that kind of directional stuff, So, but you wouldn't be able to steal a driverless car. No. I wouldn't think. Huh. Hackers, like maybe. Hackers like definitely could. Hackers, hackers have like they're the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have a chip, go into your car, kind of, you mm-hmm. know, make it their car now. I guess hackers have it, the, the future in their hands. <laughs> Of cars. <laughs> <laughs> There's your quote for the evening, guys. There's your quote. I guess hackers have, you know, the future in, in their, their hands. hands. <laughs> Erica Lalonde. Make sure you tag it. <laughs> Erica Lalonde. Hey, this is Category 5 Technology TV. Thanks for joining us tonight. It's www.category5.tv. My name is Robbie Ferguson, and I'm here to answer your questions if you have any. So send them in. Get us in the chat room, Category 5 on Freenode, or pop us an email live at category5.tv. So I know we've got more questions there, um, so you can get those in queue. Uh, I want to say greetings to everybody who's watching us on YouTube tonight. Uh, Make sure you comment below and subscribe to our videos. Also, uh, you know, do all that stuff. Like this video if you care to, and uh, and certainly we love getting your comments, and and we love having your subscriptions as well. Uh, Our YouTube followership is is growing. We weren't on YouTube when we first started Mm -hmm. the show. Um, so, you know, over the past little while, while we've really started trying to, re- uh, to vamp that up. So we appreciate having you here. Also, blip.tv, uh, viewing through there. Nice to have you joining us. Miro Internet TV, super great to have you here. Firstrun.tv, nice to see you. And uh, everybody watching on their Roku device and wherever you're watching from as well, um, just nice to have you here. Well, All right. We got uh, a question from Mike69DE hey, Mike. in the chat room. So he has a question regarding bash strips. Mm-hmm. Um, so how can I design a script that automatically answers, uses the root password when starting, for example, MySQL and other services? Maybe it's not the best idea <laughs> to use the root account Right now, I have t- uh, two scripts uh, uh, accessed by two lens from the lines, de- uh, lin- yeah. lens lines. Just a typo, yeah. <laughs> lines from the desktop to start and stop some services. All right. Uh, works, but I have to enter the password manually, and I want to avoid this. Okay, so bash scripting here on Linux creating a script to do something. Not sure what you, what it is that you're trying to do here, Mike. First and foremost, um, when you're running a script, um, of course the user, well, I kind of got to back up because w- what are you doing that you need to initiate MySQL through a bash script? Because if it's installed in an init.d, uh, it's going to automatically, pardon me, the daemon's going to be running and, and it's automatically there. If you're trying to use like a PHP script, is that... Can you kind of explain a little bit what you're trying to do? So should you be using a script that automatically sudos and creates a super user environment and then does stuff? Probably not. Instead, your approach should be to create the script agnostic of who the user is, but then run the script as the super user. So that means um, if you are, for example, wanting it to run automatically, do it through a cron job and run that cron job as the super user, the root user. You could also have it running um, through like rcs.d and have it so that it's running as a user, uh, as the root user on boot. Um, Beyond that, you don't want to have a script that automatically elevates applications during the execution process to root because then you're opening up yourself to severe um, exploitability, if you will, Mm -hmm. if somebody were to get a hold of that script. 
Um, and then it totally depends on what you're doing. I mean, if you're doing things over SSH, you can create um, you can create keys for your for your computer so that you don't have to authenticate using a password. That's always helpful if you're using like SMBFS or something like that, but not clear about what you're trying to do. So I'll just say probably best to elevate the script that contains all the commands, not try to elevate the commands in the script. So I hope that helps. <laughs> Cool. Um, we didn't see any more questions there. All right. But if I go to our emailed questions, um, we have one from uh, Demi Elisizia. Um I'm sorry if I butchered your last name. Um, but hey, Robbie, my church plans to make live video streaming of its service every Sunday. This is cool. kind of new for us. I would like to have some knowledge about what should I prepare for the hardware and software, how fast the internet should be for, um, for the info of my church, and it's, it's kind of using Panasonic MX70. Okay. Um, is it possible to connect them to the hardware, or should I, uh, should I have changed it with HD video mixer? And in case um, I in case I have a website, and is it possible to stream through it, and hmm. or should I use a particular sites to broadcast it? So basically, it sounds to me as though you're just looking for general advice mm -hmm. as to how to do it. And the one thing that I am looking up here is that uh, mixer that uh, that Erica has mentioned here. So this looks like the one. This looks like the back. I'm just looking at what kind of connectors you have. Um, you've got audio out. So this guy has got. It looks like BNC outputs, right? So as long as you're... Oh, you've got... S, is your SDI out? Yeah, there you go. You've got an SDI output. So what you would want is something like a Decklink card uh, in your computer to be able to capture from this device. And it's going to be... I mean, that's still HD, right? It's still going to look really, really good. You don't need to change to HDMI. The reason that we actually use HDMI here is because we're able to use consumer peripherals. So HDMI is actually just a cheaper route. Uh, to go because you've already got SDI equipment you could just go that route so go to cat5.tv slash bh and I'm going to do a quick search for deck link from Blackmagic Designs let's see if that's the one I think that's SDI input yes so there you go 280 bucks for this little PCI Express card it's an X1 so it doesn't take up much room and you can put a couple of them in if you need to uh, and that's going to get your SDI input from that mixing console. Okay, so you've got that now. You've got a capture device that's going to do the video. And then, of course, you run the audio into your sound card as well. And you mix it all together with software. That's where we look at something like Wirecast. Telestream Wirecast starts at 500 bucks, So very economical for professional video broadcasting um, software. Um, that said, in your instance, because you've got this nice SDI mixing console, you might be able to get away with just using inbuilt um, broadcasting tools such as YouTube's you know, ability to broadcast using uh, Wirecast for YouTube. But you need to have a certain am amount of followers, I think, for that. Um, so with regards to so that's to create the stream, sure. Um, look at Wirecast, cat5.tv slash Wirecast. Um, see if that has features that you want to add to your chain. Where that's advantageous, okay, just to back up a little bit, I'm talking about how you can stream through Ustream's broadcasting tools, and you can stream through U uh, YouTube's broadcasting tools. Wirecast is, it happens before the stream goes out. So as you can imagine, understanding audio chains and video chains, nice thing about having Wirecast in the mix uh, from cat5.tv slash Wirecast is that you'd be taking direct SDI off the board, and then with Wirecast, you could be recording to disk at the same time as you're broadcasting out. And when you're recording to disk, it can be a different frame size, it can be a different bit rate, it can be different video and audio qualities than the stream that's going out, because the stream that's going out is going to be much less quality because it's limited to your internet connection, as you already understand. So with Wirecast, you can set up like a really good solid record to disk. It's like a digital recorder. As long as your hard drive is fast enough to, to handle the throughput, uh, you'll be able to record the file in real time in full HD. Beautiful stuff. 
So then you create a secondary channel that's going to actually broadcast out to YouTube or Ustream uh, or Justin.tv. All of the options are included with Wirecast. And then you can set that down to a much less, you know, smaller screen size, smaller bit rate, and it's going to use a, a lot less bandwidth. And what internet connection you use is going to be entirely reliant on what, uh, what kind of um, broadcast quality you want during the live broadcast. Keep in mind you're going to be recording to disc as well so after the service you can burn it to DVD, you can burn it, uh, you can share it with people on flash drives, you can put it up on your website and stream it directly off your website, you can put it on a YouTube channel and you then have access to this vast resource of YouTube viewers. Um, so, you know, there's all these different things. We're happy, very, very happy to be able to help you um, make your mm -hmm. decisions. So, you know, keep the questions coming. Um, even if you want a video conference with us or have a phone call, pick up the phone, give me a call during a live show or after the fact too is fine. But hopefully that'll point you in the right direction. So internet connection, absolutely DSL is your minimum. And that's really hurting you. Um, video quality on a DSL connection, you've got about one megabyte, uh, one megabit up. You're not going to be able to push more than half of what is available to you because you've got other things going on. Certainly in a church environment, you probably are sharing the internet connection with multiple users, multiple computers. So that's not a good situation for broadcasting. You're going to need to consider, okay, if I've got this many computers all on this one connection and it's only one meg up, I don't have enough bandwidth to do more than 200 kilobits up, which is not good. Um, you probably want to have a dedicated internet connection. Cable, uh, like coaxial uh, internet, is going to give you more speed, more throughput for upstream than DSL can provide. So cable can give you 2 meg, 10 meg up. Um, here in Canada, at least, that's, a, that's about the limit, is about 10 meg up. And then if th that will allow you to broadcast full HD. We broadcast at 480p full 480p through YouTube and then we record to disk at 720p and after the show we upload the 720p files just to give you an idea of how that works so that our upload during the live show isn't maxing out our connection but we can later add the higher quality file for those who want to download it or watch it on demand so thank you very much for the question yeah th thanks uh, that was from uh, David and from Indonesia oh cool that's thanks, pretty David. cool uh, we have a question from our chat room. Uh, it's SR Wenches, or hey Sir yeah. Wenches. I have a cheap 27 inch monitor Kay. that I'd like to use for a nice picture frame. Uh, what's a cheap, low power way of doing it and grabbing the mm. photos off the server? Um, preferably Rico Magic, XMBC on Raspberry Pi, something else. Yeah. That's kind of what I'm leaning toward is kind of like a Raspberry Pi kind of mod or something like that. Um, because it's a monitor, d the question becomes, does it have HDMI input? Because HDMI is typically not for computer monitors, mm -hmm. but some of them do have a HDMI input. So that would be the question. Um, so the Rico Magic devices primarily are all HDMI output for the HD stuff. Um, this one, the MK602, also has the AV output. So if you have composite, you know, the red, uh, white, and blue, or red, white, and yellow. Um, so that would give you, you know, access on a different TV. So that might not be the device for you. Um, is there a cheap solution that I, I think probably just the the Raspberry Pi running, um, you know, just the multimedia version of that? What was the one that uh, our viewer was using? Um, our viewer, he says that he's not um, using anything at the moment, um, but he's not too sure what to use. Okay. Uh, from the server. Uh, Melanthus on, on Twitter today sent us that message and uh, uh, Rasp BMC. Mm. That's what I thought it was. I just wanted to be sure. Rasp BMC. Probably because it's XBMC on mm. a Raspberry Pi. So that's most likely the route that I would kind of direct you. R-A-S-P BMC dot com find out more information about that because then you can do it really really cheaply right. and while I think you know the 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 novelty of having a Rico magic device and not having to build anything or use any time to get it up and running is beautiful um, I think that's probably the route you're gonna want to go duct tape it to the back of the monitor there you go. <laughs> you could do anything with that huh. you can bedazzle good luck it. <laughs> you <can> bedazzle <laughs> 
Hey. That's awesome. <laughs> Bedazzling is still in. <laughs> well, if you're me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we got another question in the chat room from SWL Brazil. Hey there. Uh, can you suggest a simple GTK calendar application? Google and Mozilla Solutions is not for me. Hmm. Honestly, I don't use any GTK calendaring application so I don't know what to suggest I mean evolution was what I did use but everything that I do now for calendaring is in the cloud the proverbial cloud as we mentioned last week I use Google Calendar and then I use what I actually do because I'm a PHP developer right so I like to build stuff that works for me and there's something called full calendar and is not GTK I know you're asking specifically for GTK and maybe the chat room has a good uh, a good couple options for you, but Full Calendar is a free PHP script that taps into your Google Calendar, and, and now all of a sudden you've got control over programming this thing, and I love that because as a programmer, I like to be able to take the code and, yeah. and you know work with it, So, um, but that's maybe not what you're looking for. Evolution has a good calendar, and it's you know Exchange compatible and all that kind of stuff, and I'm not sure if these days if it taps into Google Calendar or not, um, certainly through iCal files, but not sure if it's interactive with the API or not. Um, so that's one to look at, Evolution. And did the chat room have any suggestions? We welcome them. And of course, you can check out the chat logs. Uh, if you're watching this after the fact and you want to know, hey, what did the chat room say? Just go to our website, category5.tv. Click on the show notes for episode number uh, 312. And you'll see the chat logs right there up at the top. So We got, uh, someone's also saying the Thunderbirds calendar as well. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, Thunderbird intru introduced a calendar a couple years ago. I forgot all about that. Uh, let's see, Thunderbird calendar. There was a different name for it at the time. So check that out, Lightning. That's it. So yeah, there's an option for you. That's probably, I would guess that's that's pretty active. Sunbird. That was another one. Huh. I don't know what's what anymore. <laughs> so many calendars. So there's, but there's some great projects. Mozilla.org slash projects slash calendar and again the notes uh, will have links for you for episode number 312 thanks for the suggestion in the chat room there I didn't catch who who mentioned that oh. um the, I mentioned that was a Kel uh, Kek 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 all right hey we're uh, we're nearly out of time here so uh, could we hit the inbox and yes. and uh, thank you for sending in your questions uh, in the chat room there as well we appreciate that thank you um, what do we have I see a lot of emails coming in so oh yes um, we have one from uh, Todd Col Colony. Um, Robbie, I've hey seen Todd. I've seen your video here um, about multiple USB webcams. All right. You used separate PCI or PCIe cards for each camera, and your reasoning was that you don't like having multiple cams on one host. Not now, a good idea, yeah. Now it's common knowledge that all USB 2.0 devices don't actually <coughs> use the 3.0 uh, controllers. They, they use the 2.0 controller and are simply passed through by the 3.0 bus. Anyhow, what this means is that I can't connect multiple USB 2.0 cams to a USB 3.0 host and expect to ever get more than... Um, four four eighty um, millibyte Me megabits megabits yeah. out of it because right. they're going through the USB two point oh bus. It, well, USB three point oh bus is backward compatible with the USB two point oh devices. So if you're using a USB two point oh webcam, it will only operate it still at four hundred eighty megabits a second. But having a USB three point oh bus means that there's more. Um, how would you say there's there's more bandwidth available to the card not to the device because the device itself is still going to run only 480 megabits a second if it's USB 2 but the card itself has less chance of maxing out the bus if you have a card that operates USB 2.0 guaranteed speed 480 megabits a second and a device that operates at 480 megabits a second connected to that and all of a sudden your device is using all the bandwidth of that card it can turn off your camera so th so it can be advantageous to go with a 3.0 card just to have that additional uh, bandwidth on the card doesn't affect the the camera at all 
but I see what you're saying, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he's also <laughs> saying that um, his problem is I'm trying to connect as many Logitech C920s to a computer as possible for a specific broadcast need. Right. And I'd love to be able to get away from big motherboards with multiple PCIe la- lanes. Okay, so see, I went the route of having a motherboard that had uh, two or three PCIe lan- lanes and so mm-hmm. I, and, and actually different chipsets within it. So I actually had two chipsets for the PCIe uh, bus. So, um, so I can have the cards separated over two different chipsets, which is nice. You're looking to instead um, simplify it and make it smaller. The thing, the thing is, is that you've got limits on the bus on your motherboard because a lot of these cards are going to be X1. So um, if you put too much data throughput, which is video, right? HD video is going to use a lot through that bus. So you could max it out, and that can be a problem when you're doing video broadcasting. Uh, I see a couple of links in the email here. Um, says that there are a couple of PCI cards, uh, PCIe cards, I should say, that provide four independent USB 2.0 controllers on board. Um, so I'm just going to take a look at these for you and see what uh, what it is that you're looking at. So, in case it's not clear, what our viewer is trying to do is connect multiple HD webcams from Logitech into a computer for broadcasting live while not having to have a whole bunch of cards to plug those into. So I'm looking at these uh, devices that you're, lo- that you're interested in. Okay, so first one is this USB 2.0 controller card. Um, is it four separate buses? See, what, what you might be misunderstanding is that it has four ports, but it's still one bus. There's only one chip on that. See that? Hmm. So there's only one chip. There's only one bus. And so, so, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, it, does that not tell me that it's only 1.5 megabit data transfer rate? Mm. It's a, the whole card is 480 megabits, but it's divided by 4. No, that, no what is the 1.5? Obviously not. But it would be 480 divided by 4, so you'd only, you wouldn't have enough. You know, you'd have 120 megabits Eat. per card. 4 USB in seconds. That's the fear with that. That's what I think about that first card. Second card, again, one chip. Is it four separate individual buses? It has capacitors on each. What does it say? Details. Four USB ports, but that doesn't mean, okay, four independent USB 2.0 ports and an internal shared port, but what is it sharing with? Okay. High-speed USB 2.0 data transfer rates up to 480 megabits per second on each port simultaneously. Okay, so this card looks like it is separate buses for each port. So that means that each individual port has 480 megabits per second throughput. So your PCI Express X1, which is what this one uses, that's the interface that you plug it into, is 2,000... Uh, megabits per second. So that's this connector here. Okay. So y- you basically have the four controllers each have 500 megabits divided among themselves. That's more than enough for 480. You've got 20 megabits overhead. Uh, like, mm-hmm. So yeah, should be good to go. So that card sounds all right. And that's a good idea because if, if you can accomplish that with USB 2.0 webcams, that card um, is going to push your X1 bus to the limit because, like I say, you've only got 2,000 megabits to work with. And so divided by four, each port is getting 500 megabits and each port is demanding 480. So if you have a motherboard, here's the thing. If you have a motherboard that has only one PCI Express lane and you are you have that card in it with four cameras and then you plug in a printer... Well, you've only you've already maxed out all of the available PCI Express um, bandwidth, right? Mm. You have no room to put in a second card because if the bandwidth is two thousand, it, it, it's possible. But you're pushing the limits of the of the bus, I think. That's all. But it's worth the risk for sixty five bucks. I'd try it. So. I didn't take risks, right? Because we <laughs> broadcast every Tuesday night. We don't have time to take risks. You can't take risks. Yeah. Only on New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> so give that one a try. That Star Trek, uh, Star Tech one. I was going to say Star Trek. 
Sounds like it might do the job quite <laughs> nicely. And uh, you report back to us, and I might pick up one for the studio here because that sounds mm -hmm. pretty decent. Yeah. Hey. Well, thank you for your question, uh, Todd Colony. Thank you so much for the question. And hey, if you've got questions you'd like to send in, I can't believe we're actually out of time here. But we still have more. We got more questions. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna put those ones off for next week. I'm sorry if we didn't get to them uh, for you this week. But hey, uh, do email us live at category5.tv uh, and also communicate with us throughout the week. You can visit our website. Mm -hmm. Do make sure that you register on our website so we can say greets to you and give you all kinds of silly rewards. And and if I didn't fun. get to your question in the chat room, you could always just email. It, uh, to us and, can, and it can also be read on air live the next show we will definitely do our best always do hey thanks so much for joining us tonight Erica always a pleasure it's nice always to good you. to be here so, take care have a take great care, week everybody everyone. see ya We hope you enjoyed the show. Category 5 TV broadcasts live from Barrie, Ontario, Canada every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local showtimes in your area at Category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.